Good morning, everyone. Uh, the title of my talk is Selection for Hotspot Mutations uh, in Course of E. coli. I will start with a very basic slide of bacterial evolution. There are two major genetic mechanisms, horizontal gene transfer and mutation. When these act under some positive selection pressure, then new variants with increased fitness emerge in the population. Now, as we see this bacterial evolution from a virulence perspective, we can see that uh, sometimes in a commensal population, a few individuals get transformed to pathogenic forms, either through the accumulation of horizontal transfer of virulence genes as part of large uh, chunk of DNA, a large chunk of genes, and which is also termed as pathogenicity associated, pathogenicity -associated islands, or through the accumulation of adaptive mutations that lead to pathogenicity. Over the past one decade or more, there has been tremendous amount of work on this uh, uh, role of horizontal transfer in shaping bacterial virulence evolution. And the reason behind is uh, the intensive variability within spaces in bacterial kingdom. As you see here, I just took only three E. coli genomes from three different non-pathogenic enterohemorrhagic causing diarrhea, European pathogenic causing cystitis in human. And you can see an enormous amount of genes that are horizontally transferred in each of these genomes. So that led researchers to uh, try to associate this gene presence absence thing with uh, the disease caused by a particular strain in a specific ecotype. However, in way of uh, doing this, uh, we have uh, highly forgot uh, there is also a considerable amount of genes which is present everywhere in all genomes that, that, that is core or backbone genes. As you see here, even in this diverse set of uh, uh, genomes, there, there is about 40% genes which are core. And interestingly, uh, these are the genes where these pathoadaptive mutations uh, can accumulate. These are the mutations uh, that target the genes that are shared by both non-pathogens and pathogens. Now, schematically, uh, I would like to show you uh, how actually an active mutation could enhance virulence as the bacteria move from one habitat to another habitat. Here, in this case, uh, this bacteria is binding pretty strongly to the primary or commensal habitat through its adhesin molecule. However, when this bacteria moves to a new alternative habitat where there is a different substrate molecule, without any change in the adhesin molecule, that can bind pretty poorly. Now, if there be a change, a mutation in the existing adhesin gene or a number of mutations at specific positions, which might alter the conformation of the corresponding protein, then this protein can bind very strongly to, to, to the alternative habitat surface substrate. Uh, this is a scheme, and I would like to show you a real life example of this. But before going to this, uh, I would like to talk about E. coli ecology in human. Oropharynx, stomach, large intestine, they, they, they form uh, the primary habitat in human host, which is mostly non pathogenic or commensal. Urinary tract is one of the virulence habitats, uh, alternative habitats, that is always virulent in human. And in oropharynx, an urinary tract, there is a specific type of adhesin molecule termed FIMH, which uh, binds to a specific mannose or sugar-like substrate, is critical for colonization. And this FIMH is one of the core genes of E. coli and present in almost all E. coli strains. Here is a real-life example. You can see uh, this binding of bacteria to urinary bladder epithelium. Here, the bacteria bind very poorly. Here, bacteria binds really strongly. The bacteria are otherwise isogenic bacteria without any change in its content. Only change is in the FEMH sequence. This bacteria is having a FEMH from a non-pathogenic E. coli, and this one with a FEMH from a uropathogenic E. coli. And the difference between this FEMH a single nucleotide polymorphism uh, leading to a change in the amino acid sequence. And you can see how dramatic could the effect be in terms of binding to, to the habitat surface substrate. So this actually uh, led us pretty interested uh, in, in analyzing 
image sequence from a larger data set of E. coli strains isolated from diverse clonal backgrounds or ecotypes. Uh, we used our, our zonal phylogeny uh, analysis, the, the one we developed to detect recent positive selection. And here is a scheme for that. Uh, let us have 10, se 10 sequences and uh, let them accumulate synonymous variations at different points uh, uh, in bars, and also a number of uh, non-synonymous variations as well. The synonymous variations, as to remind you, does not alter the corresponding amino acid sequence. Non-synonymous ones alters the corresponding amino acid sequence, so these are the structural changes. Now, if we want to reconstruct phylogenetic tree out of these sequence data set, that might look something like this. Here, these black solid circles represent allelic variants. So each allelic variant is emerging through the accumulation of either a single synonymous variation or a single non-synonymous variation. And if you look carefully uh, um, to, to this uh, allelic variants, there would be four allelic variants which emerge out of synonymous variations, and the difference between them is just through synonymous variations. So these four actually form a single structural variant. On the other hand, these red ones here, you can see they, they emerge out of non-synonymous variations. These are different structural variants. Now at this point, if we want to convert this DNA tree into a protein tree uh, so that each node corresponds to a unique structural variant. So we would have a core single structural variant encompassing all these, all these four allelic variants, something like this. And, and uh, we would also have all these structural variants at the tips. So these structural variant, we hypothesize, uh, is circulating in the population for long enough time to accumulate synonymous variations within themselves. So this suggests that this is uh, a structural variant which is of evolutionary long-term nature, whereas the ones that are single allelic variant, they are uh, probably very recent in the population, so didn't have enough time to accumulate synonymous variations. So we separate these two types of structural variants multi-allelic and single allelic in two zones. Inner zone with multi-allelic uh, having evolutionary long-term variants and outer external zone with uh, single allelic recent variants. We also uh, do another thing with zonal phylogeny, detect the hotspot mutations. If you look uh, at this tree carefully, there is a single position that has been attacked by multiple types of multiple mutations independently. Uh, these are separate mutations as shown by different color codes. So you can see these are all independent phylogenetic and unlinked mutations at the same amino acid position. So these are termed hotspot mutations. And this hotspot presence of these hotspot mutations is a very strong indicator of adaptive evolution because it suggests that uh, the replacement at a specific amino acid position uh, probably provides an adaptive advantage uh, to, to, to the organism and therefore is repeatedly selected in diverse allelic backgrounds of clones that are competing for survival in the same environment. Now, uh, if we uh, just denote them uh, with a specific position, say position 27 where, say, aline is getting transformed to either valine or tonin, you can readily find out there are two possible types of hotspot mutations. One is parallel hotspot mutations, that is same mutations at same position, and the other is coincidental hotspot mutations, that is different mutations, valine or threonine, at the same position. So the implication of parallel hotspot mutations could be such that the selection is acting to modify uh, the function of the encoded protein in a very specific fine-tuned manner, so the same changes is happening again and again across different allelic backgrounds. On the other hand, for this coincidence, it could be the case that selection is there to eliminate the function of the encoded protein or to eliminate the epitope recognition and bodies. So therefore, uh, they would prefer to have a coincidental heart mutation that is multiple different types of mutations, but at specific positions that are crucial for the overall structural and functional integrity of the protein. So we use this zonal phylogeny to uh, image a larger data set 
And from this kind of tree, to, uh, to, uh, the, the main message is that there are two important things. One is there is a large number of hotspot mutations out of different hotspot positions, as you see here in blue. And they're all, uh, almost all of them are found to be of recent nature. So if image and evolution via accumulation of hotspot mutations are able the question is whether it is just recent or recurrently recent, meaning that it might appear in the population whenever we sequence it as recent, but it could be something like that. It's appearing there, uh, adapting and staying there for short term and then disappearing, and after some time, it's reappearing uh, along uh, another evolutionary background. Just to show it schematically, this is an adaptive variant in virulence habitat. Now, as this bacteria, goes back or tries to go back to the original population, the, the, the primary habitat, it would be of lower fitness. It can bind strongly to, to this uh, surface substrate, and it would be outcompeted by the existing population there due to functional trade-off effects. And as we look back in the E. coli ecology, so this is a commensal habitat uh, which actually always uh, throws E. coli subpopulation to, 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 to the habitat, so this is kind of a source habitat for E. coli in human host. On the other hand, in this very stay there, adapt there, but whenever they try to go back to uh, uh, the other habitats, uh, they, they, they get outcompeted or selected out of the population by the existing population they are in. So these, uh, this is the habitat which can be termed sink or dead end habitat for E. coli in human host. And uh, actually, uh, so we, we finally conclude uh, for FEMAGE that FEMAGE adaptive evolution through the accumulation of hotspot mutation are uh, not just recent but of short-term nature and due to repeated sourcing nature of adaptation to these transient habitats. And we then hypothesize that this kind of sourcing evolutionary dynamics could be a major mode of virulence evolution in E. coli. So what we did, we, we uh, went on uh, analyzing other core genes in E. coli at, at a genome level to see if we find our similar nature in other genes as well. So the primary goal to detect genes undergoing adaptive evolution through the accumulation of hotspot mutations. For this, we used 14 strain datasets which were completely sequenced. They were isolated from four different ecotypes, extra-intestinal, non-pathogenic, enterohemorrhagic, and Shigella or enteroinvasive E. coli. And as we construct the orthologistic dataset, we found maximum number of genes that are present everywhere. Those are the core genes. And we found about 300 core genes affected by hotspot mutations. Very interestingly, we found maximum number of, or, or, or major number of genes, about 75% of genes, affected by parallel hotspot mutations. So there is predominance of parallel hotspot mutations. Positive selection? Well, it's too early to say because these parallel hotspot changes Though might appear as hotspot mutations, it could also be a result of recombination event. So we had to remove the recombinant. We used uh, three statistics, phi, max, chi, and neighbor similarities code to remove. And we found about 75% uh, of uh, genes having hotspot mutations to be non-recombinant. And we recalculated uh, the, the, the frequency of different types of hotspot mutations non-recombinant data set, and we found the same trend that is predominance of parallel hotspot mutations. So the recombination is not found to be responsible for predominance of parallel hotspot mutations. Positive selection? Well, one problem is that this, uh, we, we need to check whether these hotspot mutations are appearing randomly. So we performed simulation study, and we found in the simulated data set the frequency of hotspot mutations is way below the frequency we found for the real data set. And what expected, if, if mutations accumulated randomly, we would have a probability of getting different mutations, that is coincidental mutations, than mutations as parallel mutations. That's what we see here, but twice higher frequency in simulated data set than the parallel ones. However, in reality, we see the reverse. So hotspot mutations accumulate in non-random fashion. Positive selection? Well, we, before saying that it's due to positive selection, we uh, wanted to perform two additional tests. 
high permutability of specific dinucleotides as uh, often found in eukaryotes, uh, leading to overestimation of uh, non synonymous substitutions, and also transition transversion ratio in two different data sets. One uh, with core genes having hotspot mutations, and the other is core genes without hotspot mutations. And there is no difference, and these additional tests could not explain predominance of hotspot mutations. Therefore, we conclude hotspot mutations are results of positive selection. As a next step, we try to see whether these hotspot mutations accumulate long time ago or they are evolutionarily recent. We found there is a significant predominance of genes with recent as what found for female gene. The, the thing is, though, we analyzed female gene over a large data set, but for the, this genome wide analysis, we used only 14 strains. The genes that appear as, uh, 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 as, as uh, the, the variants that appear as a recent variants in smaller data set, if we increase more data sets, it might shift back uh, to the core of the tree, appearing as long term variants. So, we, we, uh, to test that, we go on appending new genomes at the appear in the data set and finally worked with 23 clonally unlinked genomes and found same trends going on in uh, so far as the increase in number of genes with different different types of hotspots is concerned. And finally, we predict that at 90% saturation level at 200 genomes, uh, about 50% core genes with hotspot mutations. So we conclude there is recent of short-term expansion going on uh, in the EY core gene evolution, and this could be due to repeated sourcing nature of adaptation to present habitat. So what does this mean? Is there any difference between ecotypes? Uh, just to remind you, we are working on four different ecotypes, one non-ethnic and three other pathogenic ecotypes. And we found uh, that frequency of genes with recent hotspot mutations as well as the number of recent hotspot mutations is significantly lower in non-pathogenic And also we calculated the rate of evolution of genes with recent hotspots within specific ecotypes by, 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 by normalizing it through evolutionary divergence of the strains within each Type just to get rid of the bias of internal diversity within ecotype. And what we found is this high rate of accumulation in extra intestinal pathogens, and which, which totally conform uh, with, with the view we found for FIMH. So, E. coli require a large number of recent or short term mutations to adapt to this extra intestinal. So, this is uh, uh, the summary slide for all the conclusions. Hotspot mutations in E. coli origins occur under positive selection. Hotspot mutations are mostly recent or short term origin, and they accumulate more frequently in pathogens, as we see, especially in extra intestinal ones, than in non pathogens. Very important question now is do these hotspot mutations enhance virulence? So, as a future direction, we uh, continue analysis of additional genomes uh, uh, of uh, E. coli. Uh, presently, we have 80 plus genomes in hand to analyze. We're also uh, analyzing other species such as Salmonella, Yersinia, and Streptococcus. Uh, we are expanding our microevolutionary analytical tools, and as the data set increases, we, uh, we can perform phenotype genotype association studies for large uh, scale data sets. And we are creating bacterial pathogens virium database. Uh, this virium database uh, will curate uh, all genetic variations in a specific uh, in, in a species population. Uh, and we are real on uh, the E. coli virium project right now. And I have poster D19, which talks uh, in more detail about this E. coli virium project. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my supervisor Evgeny Sokorenko, my lab mates, my collaborators. And I would like to thank NIH for funding this work, and also would like to thank ISCB, Department of Energy and National Science Foundation, for letting me be here uh, in front of you to present my work uh, by providing me with travel ship. And finally, thank you all for your patience. There is none uh, in your a preference toward seeing hotspots with more recent events. I'm surprised you should see old hotspots. Uh, I, I, you should see old hotspots. You should see many things that. Yeah, yeah, there are old hotspots. Dominated by the new ones. 
Yeah. Is that built into your system anywhere? I'm, I'm totally surprised by that. Yeah, so actually there are a lot of old hotspots here, but the, the, the dominant the dominant of the recent ones, but there are still a lot of old hotspots. So I showed the matrix analysis based on the 75 strains, but when I performed it for 570 strains for diverse ecotype, and we, we found that there are a lot of uh, heart mutations, there are long-term variants, they are there. And, and it is also, I didn't, uh, I didn't show because of time about uh, uh, this long term part of thing. There are a lot of studies uh, I'm doing. And, and th these are a kind of, of metabolic importance, uh, the genes with metabolic importance, uh, the path thing. And they're, they're there. Yes? Um, it is known that pathogens in general uh, exhibit hyper variability for uh, different reasons. So here you analyze one. Can you elaborate on impact of just uh, different different like uh, composition of genomes in terms of uh, presence or absence of different genes and also on other types of sequence variation? Do you observe a uh, difference between pathogens and non-pathogens in sense of different uh, other types of sequence variations? Well, you're talking about uh, other types, meaning uh, the, the deletions. Yeah, and, for, and, for yeah. instance. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, they're, they're there. And uh, this is uh, actually the first step when we wanted to uh, look at the smaller subs of the, uh, that is, the core genes. And if we look at the core genes, there are, so if you remember, we are working with f uh, four different types, and we found most recent events of hotspot mutations in extra internal pathogens. So this is a, a, a type of uh, habitat where we, we see a lot of horizontally transferred genes. And as you look at the genes which are restricted to this, uh, this particular habitat uh, uh, that is extraintestinal pathogenic strains of E. coli, there we can see a lot of deletions, insertions, and so many other things. But uh, here I show you basically, uh, just a result of the core genes that are present everywhere, just to show you the importance of core genes. It's not like uh, most of them are housekeeping and, and not evolving neutrally. It's not the case, what we normally believe. And, uh, and uh, so far as the whole transfer is concerned, as I showed you in the first couple of slides, that there's enormous amount of research going on uh, to find out presence, absence of genes in different ecotypes and trying to associate them with diseases, etc. There are a set of genes which are restricted to a particular ecotype, and there, within this clonal ecotype thing, they're evolving. So it's kind of within clonal evolution going on. So these horizontally transferred genes also are evolving through mutations. So that's also we've found here for, at least for extraintestinal pathogenic E. coli. Okay, okay, I, I got it in terms of genome composition. So mm -hmm. acquisition of new genes, loss of genes. What about uh, evolution of particular genes, particular proteins via non, not sub, uh, replacement substitutions? But due to, let's say, yeah, uh, expansion of repeats, translations uh, of protein frag sands, do you observe difference in between pathogens and non pathogens of E. coli in terms of rates of those events? As an overview, I would say we observe this, but I cannot talk about this in detail because the whole idea of this whole genome analysis was, as I showed you, based on our finding and experimental verification of FIMH, which is a core gene present everywhere. So we just went on, this is the first step for us to went on the whole genome analysis of E. coli for only extracting the core genes and trying to see how they evolve. But there are all other kinds of variations besides this uh, uh, mutation through single nucleotide polymorphisms. Mutations could be insertions due to deletions, and they also really affect. And, and uh, we see this, but we haven't done in-depth analysis on this. We still have time for a question. If that is not the case, thanks again. Mm -hmm.